Thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here tonight. You know, uh, we really do face an incredible crisis when it comes to anti antibiotic resistance, antimicrobial resistance in this country and around the world. But I'm happy to say that tonight I was encouraged to talk a little bit more about the hope for the future rather than the end of mankind. So I'll try to live up to the expectations. We have an in innovation conundrum, at least that's how I like to refer to it in healthcare. Technological progress is slow and it's challenging. Part of the reason it's slow is because of our insular culture. And part of it is because of the way that innovation occurs in healthcare, which is slightly different than other sectors of the economy. For example, in healthcare, technological innovation typically occurs by two primary mechanisms. One of the mechanisms is what I call push innovation, and the other I like to refer to as pull innovation. Take robotics. The surgical robot was first pushed into the operating room approximately 20 years ago. And since that time, surgical robotics has been dominated by a single platform technology with very little change. The result is there's significant barriers to entry for other new technologies, and innovation occurs much slower than it does in other segments of the economy. Contrast that to your iPhone or your smartphone, the revolution in biometric wearables and the Internet of Things or the medical Internet of Things. Most of those innovations were actually pulled into the healthcare sector by physicians and by patients to help improve monitoring and care. And as a result, there are very few barriers to entry and innovation is nearly continuous. Now, we have a challenge in healthcare, and it relates to how we approach things, especially when we're dealing with life and death matters, life and death decision making in healthcare. Medicine is particularly insular in that area because of our fear of the unknown. In, in the uh, soliloquy uh, in Shakespeare's Hamlet, You'll recall that in the to be or not to be soliloquy, he's contemplating whether it's better off to be dead than to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Well, in many ways, doctors and patients today face a similar life and death decision when it comes to the use of antibiotics, to treat or not to treat. We know, both patient and doctor, that most common infections are caused by viruses. And the treatment with antibiotics, using antibiotics to treat a, a virus is not only ineffective, but it essentially ensures that over time, bacteria will become progressively more and more and more resistant. As I said in 2015, they're programmed to win that battle, and they will ultimately win it. Now, the problem then relates to how do we make better decisions at the point of care? And I have argued that that will never change until both the patient and the doctor have the information that they need to know, not to guess, what's causing the infection. So it's fear. Fear is the challenge that we need to overcome. It's emotion, not intellect. But the answer is an intellectual one. It's information. Can we provide the information at the point of care that would convince both the, the patient and the physician that we knew what was causing the infection and therefore could make a better and more informed decision as to what the proper treatment would be? What would a solution that could answer that question be? Well, because it's an information solution, there's a technological answer to it. But in order to get there, you need a device that could capture the information and report it back to both the patient and the physician in real time at the point of care. That was our challenge at Seraph Biosciences. Well, what do you do when you're afraid of the dark? You want somebody to turn on the light. Light reveals things about our world, our physical world. Sometimes it reveals things we don't want to see. 
if you take a single wave of, wa wavelength of light and shine it on a bacteria, small fractions of, of reflections will come back that give extraordinary detail about the molecular structure of the organism down to the strain. In fact, it provides a molecular fingerprint that could be used to provide that information that would inform better treatment decisions at the point of care. Now, if it were just about brilliant ideas and brilliant science, then it would be fairly easy to create the solution. I say that a little bit tongue in cheek because the technology that actually will allow you to do that is anything but easy. But the point I'm trying to make is that the bigger challenge in healthcare and in medicine in particular, because of our insular thinking and our approach, which is very careful, appro appropriately careful and prudent, is that the biggest challenge is actually taking those innovations from the bench where the discoveries are made and translating them out into the clinical application and disseminating them widely so they could be at the bedside and be used to make decisions for patients. That's what I refer to as the bench to bedside conundrum. And that's actually the biggest challenge we face at Seraph Biosciences every day because of the magnitude of this problem that we're facing, the complexity of the science and the technology, the expense of the research and the development the financial and regulatory barriers to commercialization, the skepticism of the public as well as the scientific community, and the motivation of the team to persist despite the fact that 90 plus percent of biotech startups fail. Now, we can look to a Detroit innovator for the answer. Henry Ford faced a similar skepticism back at the turn of the last century. And in 1908, we all know he introduced the Model T and five years later, he introduced the concept of mass production, if you will, the assembly line, which took the production of a car from 12 plus hours by hand down to two hours. But what he really accomplished was to put long distance personal transportation, if you will, in the hands of the masses so that ordinary people could go wherever they want, whenever they want. That was a revolution. And it actually set the stage for the growth of a, of a robust middle class in America. And the city of Detroit became the epicenter of an industrial revolution that had never before been seen in the long catalog of human history. Now, everything has its season. Uh, the city of Detroit reached its peak population shortly after World War II in 1950. And over the ensuing 70 years, nearly two-thirds of the population left the city. But we can look to the grit and ingenuity of, in, of inventors and entrepreneurs like Henry Ford to inform our vision of the future of Detroit. Take my colleague, my friend, and my partner, Dr. Greg Auner, who's with us tonight. Like myself, Greg is a native of Detroit of fairly humble roots. He, he holds 30 or more patents in all variety of smart sensor technology, chemical, environmental, biological. He was the perfect partner for a solution that could help solve the antimicrobial resistance uh, crisis. In 2014, we spun off a revolutionary technology that we call Saraspec. Saraspec is something that I believe, if we are successful, and I believe we will be successful, will change the paradigm of care for infectious diseases. What is Saraspec? How does it work? Well, Saraspec is a novel technology, and it essentially does what that century-old physical principle tells us it could do which is to say it measures reflections from a single wavelength of light created by a laser, molecular reflections, and I'm talking one in 10 billion photons this, this technology can measure. And it gives incredible data about molecular structure, an actual fingerprint down to the strain of the virus, and it, can, it is giving us information to tell us 
when the organism is resistant to antibiotics. In the 21st century, biointelligent innovations are occurring at the interface of the traditional life, physical, and information sciences. Sarah Speck is at that interface. It's intended to revolutionize care by providing information that could otherwise not be obtained, so there's a, a technology component and could not be shared in real time with physicians and patients at the point of care, and we hope we'll be able to at least improve the care of infection disease, if not, be the nidus for a biointelligence revolution starting right here in Detroit. Over the last few years, we've seen a 50% increase in startups in the city of Detroit, many of them in the technology space, like Seraph. I'm sitting here with visionaries, entrepreneurs, innovators. You'll hear from some of them tonight all capable of mobilizing and actualizing uh, the, the limitless potential, really, of Detroit's uh, urban core. Or we can let the dictums of convention, which like to look at Detroit as a relic of an industrial past, define our future, rather than the test bed for the solutions of the future. In 2015, when I presented at TEDx Detroit, um, we had a problem, we had an idea about a solution. That idea has progressed through conceptual science to numerous prototypes, business plans, software releases, etc. I'm very confident that if we persevere, and if we are successful, and I believe we will be successful, that we are gonna be able to provide for the first time to clinicians a technology at the point of care that will allow them to make better decisions. And my sincere hope is that by making better decisions about the use of antibiotics, we can at least bend the curve of the antimicrobial resistance crisis. The other hope that I have, of course, is that Seraph and other biotechnology startups will be the catalyst for a biointelligence revolution that begins right here at Wayne State, right here in Detroit. Thank you very much.